Uh, Daryl, uh, uh, we, we've come a, a pretty fast route, quite frankly, over a couple of years. I mean, um, uh, as you know, I've been running Blue and Gray for, I'm in our 29th year now, and, and uh, you have been a, uh, a Western historian and uh, a specialist in and along the Cincinnati area and Ohio and Kentucky. And, and um, I'm not embarrassed to say that, you know, uh, because there are a lot of historians out there, we just really didn't know each other. We just never met in, in this sort of stuff. And, and then um, I don't know how it was that we got put together, but um, um, you had a few ideas that you proposed to me and pitched. I said, okay, who the hell is going to come to a tour by Daryl Smith? You know, I got to <laughs> sell, sell this to national audience. And, and I think I was honest. We guess it look, you know, I mean, you know, I, I can throw a, I can throw a party for somebody. And if nobody knows who party's for, unless the food is mighty damn good, ain't nobody going to show up. And so, so we bridged that a little bit. And, um, uh, we introduced Daryl to, uh, to our group last year. It was a, it was a, uh, COVID, um, challenged opportunity that, um, that put us in, in, in some, um, uh, constraints, and I think certainly held down the audience. No, absolutely no question about the Delta variant. As you remember, just come out, it had just massacred. I think you know what happened. You remember we we had a larger group, and then it it pared down to less than a about a half a van. The very next week, I had a program in the Shenandoah Valley that went. In five days' time, it went from eight people to two people, wow. with the two people coming from across the country. So went ahead and did it, and then one of them got sick, and so the last day of the tour, it was a one-on-one -on -one tour in the Shenandoah Valley. So, you know, when you're an education group, you do it for the for the for the message. We certainly don't do it for the money, but but hopefully, with this stuff passing, we'll draw a good audience and. Um, and uh, pay our pay our way. So, uh, with that, Daryl, like to say welcome. Good to have you back, you. and uh, looking Absolutely. forward to this new program. I am as well. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, last year was it was an interesting time because it was bloody hot. Uh, that so we we did a lot of modifications on the fly, which actually worked out really really well. Um, but uh, no, I've I've appreciated the opportunity to to work with Blue Gray Education Society. And, uh, you know, I'm super excited to, to take folks to uh, a couple of my absolutely all-time favorite uh, battlefield sites. I mean, uh, between Richmond, which is Richmond, I think you have to have a guide to really kind of understand it. But Perryville, I, like Richmond. I mean, it's just, yeah, I love it. I think Richmond's <laughs> awesome. And, you know, of course, Perryville looks like it did in 1862, except maybe the high power line that runs across the battlefield. But beyond that. Uh, it is pretty much the way it was in 1862 and well over a thousand acres now saved and a vast majority of those thousand acres now have interpretation on them. So it's, it's, um, it, it's, I'm excited to get the group down. And then, you know, we're, we're mixing Munfordville with a little Rowlett station in as well. Um, so we're, we're going to hit the three major uh, engagements of the, uh, of the 1862 Kentucky campaign, also known as the Heartland campaign. So I'm very excited to, to, to get folks out. Um, those who are planning on coming, we're, we're, we'll do some walking at Perryville. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, we'll have plenty of stops in between. So, Well, you know, I, I enjoyed a great deal. And uh, uh, you're a chow hound. I was impressed. I love the Wiedemann Brewery. I loved every place you found. And um, uh, we, ate, we ate mighty good. And I think that's the advantage of moving around in the back country, especially when you go to a place like Paraville, where there is nothing but a street of dirt to eat. Uh, you've got you've got to be creative. And um, uh, you certainly in the first go um, uh, knew all the right places to go. And I have no doubt that um, that the group will be treated to some some outstanding lunch stops and maybe even a, a dinner um, venue somewhere um, uh, along the way. Absolutely. Um, what I'd like to, um, uh, to uh, introduce to the audience tonight to uh, start is um, uh, I want, I, I'd like you to talk about the anomaly of, of uh, Kentucky and its, quote, neutrality status. Why, why neutrality? What is it about the, um, what is it about the state 
that um, uh, compels it to make a determination to remain neutral and and how do the two governments um, respond to that? Well, um, you know, I, I know there's some Kentuckians on, so they, they probably know this story as well as I do. But, um, you know, Kentucky, you look at you have to look at Kentucky's heritage, I think, for one thing, the vast majority of Kentuckians, not all, but the vast majority of Kentuckians come from Virginia. Uh, you know, they're coming through the gaps, they're coming through Cumberland Gap. So the vast majority are, are Virginians, but uh, not all. Um, the ones that come down the Ohio River, Pennsylvania, there's a lot of German stock there. Um, so it becomes a little bit of a mixture state. But the heritage of, heritage of Kentucky is Virginia. Um, so there's a lot of inheritance in terms of um, just what they think and how they feel and, and, and just culture and just uh, their interactions with the, with the African-American population, et cetera, et cetera. However, they're also, it's a very strong unionist state. And I, I think that's why, and you know, I've got a good friend who loves to use the word conflicted. He's a Kentuckian, so it's perfect. Um, but you know, Kentucky is conflicted. Kentucky, and, and I'll, I'll throw Missouri in there, you get that a little bit in West Virginia as well. Those, those states are really those true, you know, we, we use the term brother against brother, that, that sort of thing. Those states are truly uh, exemplified. You have literally fathers and sons who fight on other sides, brothers who do fight on opposite sides. It happens all the time. But with Kentucky being a strong union state, so you have to think about you know, things like rail lines. Most of the rail lines tie into the north. They don't tie into the south. So goods are going north, some trades going back and forth across the north. You've got, you know, strong ties with, with river cities like Cincinnati and then right across, of course, from Louisville. Um, so you have a lot of strong economic ties uh, to keep Kentucky kind of pulled to the north. Um, but again, it's, it, it's, it, it's hard. It's a pro-slavery state. Uh, there's just no way around it. And when Lincoln makes that call for 75,000 men and, and to put down the rebellion and um, sends Beriah McGoffin the quota of Kentucky regiments to be raised, uh, McGoffin, who is a definitely a Southerner, a uh, Southerner by heart, um, refuses. Uh, he, he will not arm men to put down or to, to you know, put down or, or suppress a rebellion against his brother states in the deeper South. Um, there's too many strong ties there. And so, you know, Kentucky will go into this neutrality phase immediately after Fort Sumter. But it's a, it is a sham in many aspects. Um, it does keep the major forces from entering Kentucky for a period of time. But there's a lot of things that are going on. And, you know, just a couple of examples. I mean, a lot of the Kentuckians that are joining the Confederacy will join training camps just over in the, like the Tennessee border, across the Tennessee border. Um, but there's, you know, there's the home guard that's being raised. So prior to the war, there's the state guard, um, uh, state guard organization that's formed. It is mostly pro-Southern, not all, but mostly pro-Southern in, in its leaning, um, its political and, and economical leaning. Um, but there's then in response to that, you have the home, or the home guard that will be formed, which is a unionist, uh, pr mostly pro-unionist force that will be raised in Kentucky. Well, you know, you got Lincoln trying to send guns into Kentucky to arm the home guard so they can defend themselves, right? Defend them, defend their own neutrality. And, and, and so there, there's some major violations going on there. Of course, a big chunk of the Ohio River um, that, that borders Kentucky, well, most of the river is actually in Kentucky uh, proper te Kentucky territory. It's part of the state. And so anytime a, a, a gunboat, a union gunboat is going up and down the river, that's a violation of Kentucky neutrality. So, you know, we can split hairs on the neutrality piece. Um, it, you know, it really kind of comes to a head when um, a guy named uh, Gideon Pillow convinces his superior, Leonidas Polk, that they need to occupy those heights at Columbus. Uh, there have been yep. some demonstrations down in that area uh, on the Missouri side. Um, and, and so they will, uh, in early September of 1861, they will move their, their force to occupy those heights at Columbus. I mean, it, th those bluffs run 150 to 200 feet above the river. It's a, it's a natural fortification. Um, and then literally within a day or two, a guy named Hiram Ulysses Grant is reacting to that by grabbing Paducah and Smith, uh, Smithfield, Smithville uh, on Smithfield. the uh, Tennessee and uh, Cumberland rivers. And so really Grant has the ideal situation because he is holding those mouths of those rivers and of course, that will lead into you know, the Fort Donaldson campaign. But, you know, Kentucky in August, in the midsummer, they had voted in pretty much a, a, 
a pro-union legislature. Um, McGoffin's power, such as it is as, as a governor, um, he really is functioning as a lame duck. He really doesn't have much power. And so, you know, again, this neutrality phase, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's not neutral. Uh, there is a, a pretty good book that talks about the uh, neutrality phase. Can't think of the guy's last name, but it's called Divided Loyalties. It's published by Savas Beatty. It came out a few years ago. I would pick that up. I mean, it really, it will really elucidate someone on the Kentucky, you know, quotes, neutrality phase um, uh, quite well, I think. So you you just have this going on. And, and so you've got a pro-union legislature, a, a lame duck pro-Southern um, governor. And, and so not a lot is being accomplished until those forces start to come into Kentucky after the, the, the true violation of neutrality. You know, what I, what I found interesting and, and you, you hit on it, you hit on a really key point that I think oftentimes is, is missed in, in all of this uh, early westward expansion. Of course, Virginia back before the American revolution had uh, its eyes uh, into the Ohio Valley uh, West Virginia was part of Virginia. Uh, the, the mountain passes and so forth, whether it was Cumberland Gap into Kentucky area or whether it was uh, the move into the Ohio Valley and so forth. Um, and you had Pennsylvania seeking to move westward and so forth. The, the whole issue of the, of the uh, Mason-Dixon line comes forward in, in trying to determine where westward expansion goes. And what, what's interesting to me is the ethnicity of the of moving the, the Europeans, of course, the Germans have just undergone their wars of unification 10, 15 years before. And many of the people who are the losers in the war have bailed, have come to the United States and they've ended up uh, populating the Ohio Valley because they have come in through and, and dropped that. So so you have people who are very fiercely loyal to a country that has welcomed them. They're living in this area and all that keeps them from crossing and tearing people up is the Ohio River. That, uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a, 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 a governor of Kentucky, it seems to me that you don't particularly necessarily want to invite people to fight in your backyard. Um, which is exactly what would have happened had Kentucky declared as Virginia declared. And, and instead of all the, the misery and bloodshed of Tennessee, it would have started uh, in Kentucky. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so, so it's, it's a fascination. But then, of course, as you, as you lay out and talk about, the, um, about the, the efforts to move and um, – maintain a neutrality uh the reality of the matter is, is that's a lot of damn real estate from uh from the western part of the state all the way over to uh western virginia which of course where huntington is is part of virginia at that time it's not west virginia so so i i, I think that that it's fascinating to see that and of course the once the uh, once the Confederates realize what the importance of that area is, what do they do in terms of, uh, of, of planning to keep an eye on Kentucky and, and protect themselves? What, what happens? Well, from the, from the Confederate side, I mean, you, you have, first Leonidas Polk is assigned by Jeff Davis to, to come out West and, and be in command for a period of time, but you have, you know, the, the great savior, you know, the Albert Sidney Johnston is going to uh, eventually reach uh, Richmond. You know, he's coming across from California and he finally will reach Richmond. He gets his assignment, which is department number two. And department number two runs from the Appalachian slash Allegheny Mountains all the way across to the uh, Mississippi River and over the river uh, into uh, the Trans-Mississippi, what we call the Trans-Mississippi Theater. He has a massive, massive department to maintain of course, none of these pre-war guys had ever commanded anything really larger than a few companies, a battalion, or a regiment or two. And, and so, um, you know, the, the early war reactions and leadership um, obviously fall short. But Johnston now, you know, there's, a, there's an order to pull, to pull the troops out of Columbus. 
to to try to reverse that whole neutrality violation. It's too late. Uh, it, it has already been done. And so they decide to go ahead and just stay. Well, that creates a lot of issues for, I don't know, Tennessee, for example, um, because, you know, we, in the, during the neutrality phase, where are you going to defend Tennessee? We're going to defend it pretty much on its eastern and western borders. But they did start building those forts there, Fort Henry, Hyman, and, and Donaldson. Well, then when the neutrality phase ends, those forts, of course, are not ideally suited. That creates a problem there. Of course, now there's going to be an avenue coming down those two rivers. Well, Sidney Johnson has this massive department, and he doesn't have a whole lot of troops. I've seen numbers range from you know, 25,000 to 40,000 to 45,000. But he doesn't really have a whole lot of troops to really occupy um, the, the main focus in the east would be Cumberland Gap. And then again, all the way to the Mississippi River. And he has to keep his mind or his eye also in Trans-Mississippi. Uh, Johnson becomes fixated on Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, he will start to organize an army there. Uh, and, and, and he really will be super focused on that area. He is functioning like an army commander and not a department commander. Um, and that will cause issues, of course, for the Confederacy uh, late in the late 1861 and early 1862. On the Union side, you just have this reaction of we're going to start pouring troops into the state. That's exactly what they start doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, my third great uncle is one of the first Ohioans, his regiment, to uh, from Ohio regiment to actually even cross into uh, Ohio. And that's the 35th Ohio. So I have to get that little plug in there for my friends on the, on the call. But um, so they just start pouring in, start occupying positions, right? Louisville, Northern Kentucky, and then they, they continue to move into the state. Um, of course, organization had already been going on during that sham period. There's um, the, the, the camps that are formed in central Kentucky and even a camp around Barbersville, uh, Kentucky, uh, that's raising home guard or even S East Tennesseans that are coming through the Cumberland Gap or the other gaps. And they're forming all these units, of course, during the, neutrality, the beginning of the neutrality phase. Um, but now, now we're rushing into to get to these camps. So you've got, you know, guys like George Thomas and, and of course Robert Anders, Anderson's the first Union Department commander. Uh, he's replaced by a guy named William Tecumseh Sherman, and then Don Don C. Buell winds up taking over what will become the Army of the Ohio, and they are occupying a, a big swath of the state as well. Uh, you know, they are slowly approaching, coming out of Louisville. Buell's got his force. He is moving slowly towards Bowling Green, uh, not very quickly. Um, he's ordering Thomas uh, you know, to kind of uh, keep an eye on Cumberland Gap and, and keep the eye on that area. You know, the Rock Rockcaster County, down around Somerset, all those areas he's working on. He'll also send a small force um, under James Garfield to the eastern part of the state um, uh, that'll launch a small campaign uh, as well. Um, so you've got all this kind of movement that's going around. There's not a lot of action. There's some skirmishes. There's a few little minor raids. Some guy named Captain John H. Morgan will burn down a bridge over Bacon Creek, just north of Mumfordville. So you got little raids going on, but you don't really have a lot of action of, as the forces are gathering. And I, I think each side, of course, as they did at the beginning of the war, is overestimating the other side's force and capabilities. And, and so, like I said, Buell is moving extremely slow. Buell's also now being pressured um, by McClellan and, and the federal government to occupy East Tennessee, which of course is that pet project of Lincoln, right. uh, really through, throughout, you know, over the first half of the war. Um, and, and so there's all these types of movements that are going on. You really don't start getting into action until, um, well, you get a little bit of an action. Uh, this is for Ms. Perkins who's on, the, who's on the line. You get a little bit of action in East Tennessee under William Bull Nelson. He'll do, I call it the Ivy Mountain Campaign, for lack of a better term. But he'll go and, and occupy East, Ten East Kentucky, East Tennessee, East Kentucky for a period of time, um, trying to drive the rebels that are, for that are forming at that particular point uh, out of the state. Um, and then you have Garfield uh, in early January of 1862 winning the Battle of Middle, Middle Creek. You've got Middle, Spring, or Middle Springs, uh, January of 1861 is 62 as well. Uh, which is, you know, Thomas is probably coming out party uh, a little bit there, defeating a, a force under Zollicoffer, Felix Zollicoffer. Now, Zollicoffer had invaded the state, invaded, quotes again, invaded the sure. state in, um, yeah, yeah, there we go, uh, invaded the state in, in uh, October of 1861 that results in a small battle at Wildcat Mountain in October. Uh, but he's, he's pushed back, he's defeated. He cannot sustain his 5,000 men 
in that section of Eastern Kentucky between Cumberland Gap and the Rock Castle, the Rock Castle Hills. There's just no sustenance there. And he, again, he only has about 5,000 men, you know, large brigades about what he has. Um, and then of course it's Zollicoff who will who'll pull the Confederates north of the Cumberland River and that will result uh, in the Battle of Mill Springs. So you've, you've got all those things going on. So Mill Springs is heritable, herited as this major Union victory because they needed one. And then of course this guy named Grant will move down uh, the Tennessee River at first, secure Fort Henry, which just opens up the deep south to all sorts of trouble if the, if the Union uh, can really follow up on it. And then we'll take uh, Fort Donaldson about a week later. So now that tide, that, that major tide has shifted. As a matter of fact, it's between Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson that Johnston um, in Bowling Green makes this decision. He's They have to abandon Bowling Green. The line has been outflanked. This happens before Donaldson falls. And I think a lot of folks don't put that connection together. He realizes there's an issue going on and they are going to retreat down to Nashville. They're going to abandon pretty much central Kentucky. So you got Zollicoffers, well, it's really um, George Bebb Crittman is in charge at Mill Springs for the Confederates, but you have that force that's defeated. You have the far Eastern uh, Kentucky force that's defeated. The Western flank is now opened up because of the, the, the Twin Rivers campaign and Buell is still moving, albeit slowly, um, you know, following the line of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And so he's moving slowly. So almost all of Kentucky um, by, you know, the end of February uh, or so of 1862 is under federal control. Not all, but almost all of Kentucky. Um, you know, the vast majority of it is. Um, and of course, we know what happens after Donaldson and we have the you know, Shiloh campaign. Yeah. And, and we I, have the fall, fall of Corinth. But yeah. Um, I, and that's what that's why I'd like to uh, to pivot, because I think that that the essence of this, it's, it's interesting because you go from a from a broad front in which uh, Albert Sidney Johnson is is attempting to hold on to a tenuous line that um, uh, that he's expected basically to hold all parts of the South and, and allow no incursions whatsoever. And then you get the proverbial um, puncture of the line which causes the whole line basically to implode and the penetration goes completely through Tennessee and into Mississippi and into Northern Alabama. And, and that moves everybody fundamentally into, um, into a different theater and a different means of operation that then has the effect of, of opening up flanks that heretofore were not open. And what do you get out of that is you get a Confederate army that falls back to below and then a, a slothful um, department commander who takes an incredible amount of time to uh, uncover Corinth. And before you know it, the Confederate army has moved down through Mobile, back up through Atlanta, back up to Chattanooga, and is now in a what had been just a distant end of Sidney Johnson's line. Johnson's gone now. He's dead. Um, and now a, a guy by the name of Kirby Smith enters into the picture uh, in East Tennessee. And uh, with Kirby Smith operating in and around Knoxville, and so forth, uh, suddenly, or in and around, well, from Knoxville to Chattanooga, now there's opportunity uh, to change the dimension and turn the Union armies, including Don Carlos Buell, around. And um, what I'd like you to uh, address is, um, um, tell us a little something about the enigmatic Floridian Kirby Smith. Well, yeah, um, I'm not a Kirby Smith fan. Uh, I'll just make sure we got that out right away. Um, he, he does very well, of course, at first bull run. He's personally brave. We know that. He's assigned after his wound, after he starts to recover, he's assigned to the, 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 the district or the Department of East Tennessee. He feels like it's a backwater. And in many aspects, he's absolutely right. But it's also an important job. Um, I believe the term glory hound would probably fit a Kirby Smith. Um, and I, and I believe this comes to play during the 1862 campaign, of course, because the, the inability of him to really um, 
put his army under the command of Bragg and have one major field force to, to deal with the Union presence in, in the state of Kentucky. So uh, yes, he's a Floridian. Um, you know, he's got the background, he's got the military education, he's got the, 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 the military prowess, et cetera. But I, I feel like this guy's a little bit of a glory hound. And um, it is it is going to be him that's going to change the shape of this campaign. It'll, it'll and I'll get to that in a little bit, but it'll be his decisions of, of movements um, that will actually shape this campaign and it will pull Bragg into Kentucky. That That is not the initial plan. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'll say I'm neutral about Mr. Kirby Smith, even though we share our same last name. So. Well, I think, I think the thing that, that um, always struck me about Kirby Smith as seemed to strike most of the Western commanders as people began to posture and and the glory hound may be one way of, of, you know, that might be a little harsh, but I, I don't, I think it's, it's fair enough is that a person gets command and they look to make the most of it. And, and, you know, Kirby Smith came into my life when, um, when he was seeking to find a combat commander uh, for Chattanooga, because Don Carlos Buell was now moving across Northern Alabama and, um, uh, all he had was Dan Ledbetter uh, down running, in, who was an engineer running Chattanooga, and he wants a combat guy. And so back in Richmond, they ask, and um, uh, it's offered to John Magruder, who's on his way to take the Trans Mississippi before the uh, before the seven days takes place. He turns it down, but they end up sending Henry Heath, uh, mm-hmm. who's the fourth ranking Virginian uh, from the old army over and he becomes subordinate to Smith. But, but what's interesting to me, of course, and you've hit on it, is that, um, and, and Grant goes through the same thing and, and we've kind of looked the other way and tolerated. I mean, Grant is junior to uh, Nathaniel Banks in 63. And um, you remember, what was it? The, we used to play a game of tag and you get close, but you wouldn't let them get close enough to touch you because if they touch you, tag, you're it. And so Grant doesn't want to, tag um, Banks because Banks will be the commander. He ranks him. And Kirby Smith, who has great authority and latitude to move within his theater and to penetrate Kentucky, as long as he doesn't end up in the same room with Braxton Bragg, who is a four-star, he keeps his command. And so what happens with with, uh, Kirby uh, avoiding getting tagged from uh, Bragg in Chattanooga. What what what's going to happen in in um, the fall of uh, sixty or late summer sixty two? Well, well, we'll rewind it just a smidge because you know Kirby Smith will reach out to Braxton Bragg and ask for assistance because um, you know Buell is making that slow approach and it's this very slow approach across northern Alabama and and central or southern uh, Tennessee. Let me pull up another map here for you. So this is going through, here's Buell down here. Let me get the annotation going again. Here's Buell down here moving slowly across Northern Alabama and Northern, t- uh, Northern Alabama, Southern, Southern, Southern Tennessee. He is closing in slowly on Chattanooga. His forces will wind up getting 20, 25 miles from Chattanooga. Um, so that's how close they will wind up getting. Now everybody will, will, will lambast Buell for his slow movement. 100% true, he is moving slow, but he's also being forced to use this rail line by Henry Halleck. And that rail line is yep. susceptible to raids, and he has to rebuild bridges constantly uh, across that while accumulating supplies. Buell really wants to use that railroad extension coming down. So the yep. LNN to Nashville, and then he wants to use this railroad extension coming down. Unfortunately, he's not allowed to do that. Um, so you have um, our, our good friend Kirby Smith seeing this activity, seeing this large army of the Ohio coming across northern Alabama, closing on Chattanooga. Of course, this is all um, Kirby Smith's command, right? He's got Eastern Tennessee, Chattanooga falls under his purview. So he will invite Braxton Bragg to come to Chattanooga and have a conversation. And they have a conversation on July 31st uh, of 1862. And, you know, the way the conversation that I, you know, understand it and what I've read and, and what I've researched is that they come up with this plan that they are going to try to neutralize and or defeat Buell in central Tennessee and hopefully retake Nashville because Nashville is a pretty major industrial uh, town. Of sure. course, it's the first Confederate capital to fall. It's so it's symbolic as well. 
Um, so that, that piece is going on. And the agreement is that Smith will subordinate himself to Bragg, and they're going to have this hopefully, you know, decisive battle or at least a maneuver campaign to get Buell out of central Tennessee, and then they're going to push north into Kentucky if the opportunity arises. Well, it doesn't play out that way. Uh, as we all know, it does not play out this way. Um, during July, the middle part of July of 1862, John H. Morgan has launched, launched a campaign or launched a raid into central Tennessee. It'll result in the first battle of Cynthia, which we covered last year on our tour. But Morgan will send right. a telegram message back down to Smith on July 16th. And that's that one I'll paraphrase that 25,000 to 30,000 uh, Kentuckians will rise up and join the army. 25,000 to 30,000, that's a large number. When you add these two forces together, it's probably 40 or 45,000 troops altogether under Bragg and, and Smith, maybe a little bit more. So you, you're talking about a major increase if that's true. So, you know, I think Smith becomes a little more fixated on Kentucky than Bragg does. Well, Smith, to his credit, he does say, hey, you know, I've got this Cumberland Gap situation here that I have to make sure that I take care of. And um, we'll go over here to Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap is just slightly probably off map, but it's right in this general area. Yeah. I've got to neutralize the, the federal force that's there. It's under George Morgan, uh, 7th Division of the Army of Ohio. I've got to neutralize that. And he thinks the, the way to neutralize it um, is to get around behind Morgan and really cut him off on both, both fronts. So he'll keep Carter Stevens' large division to the front. And he'll swing Henry Heath, who you mentioned, Patrick Claiborne and Thomas Churchill's divisions across the Cumberland Mountain. At, at two of those passes are just unbelievable. I can't believe they did it. And, and blockade Morgan from the rear. And, and Smith is like, but I can't stay here. We, Smith has enough supplies for 30 days. He doesn't have to go anywhere. And this force here, north of the mountain, cannot be sustained. And that was proven by Zolikoff for the, the previous October. Well, he... Um, Kirby Smith has a lot more than 5,000 troops like that Smith had. So at that point, he's going to make the run. And he's, well, not that way. This run right here. I think you have to do that, clean this up a smidge. He'll make that run and head towards the bluegrass. Because in the bluegrass, he can sustain his forces. There's forage, there's food uh, along the way. So he will, by fait accompli, he will have to pull Mr. Bragg to the north because, and Bragg will agree, well, you know, based on the information that Smith has given him that, okay, well, you're going to have to keep moving north. And if that's the case, you can't sustain your army. And so Bragg then will also move his army north into Kentucky. This great battle of central Tennessee to retake either neutralize Buell's army and or retake Nashville does not occur uh, because of these two movements. So Smith will, you know, push his force forward uh, through the month of uh, middle of August into the end of August and wind up at a place called Richmond, um, which you've alluded to. It's a great little battlefield. I'll stop there to kind of read or let you redirect. Okay. Well, I think uh, we, we've gotten to the essence, of course, of, of what we're going to uh, be dealing with in, in your program. And so uh, I don't need to um, uh, interfere too much with that, other than the fact that, of course, the Confederates have driven this campaign. They have they have taken the initiative uh, uh, because of Halleck's um, um, uh, uh, indifference is not the right word. His his uh, tunnel vision. Uh, he has believed that his way was the only way, and he doesn't realize, of course, that the Confederates have taken the initiative away from him in a, a really remarkable march. Have put themselves in position of uh, being on the flank of the Federals and having the opportunity literally to undo everything that uh, Grant has accomplished uh, since February of uh, 62, because if you can fall on the uh, federal supply depot at Louisville, uh, you have destroyed every operation south of Louisville because uh, you can't get the food there. And so, so, um, uh, there is a uh, belief that uh, Kentucky were 20 to 30,000 waiting to go into the ranks. Um, certainly uh, Bragg should bring a, um, a Kentucky Confederate governor with him and, um, and uh, get Kentucky in the proper alignment with the other slave polling states, the Confederacy, and um, 
So tell us um, uh, what happens uh, when Bragg moves into Kentucky. Well, I'm going to, I'll bring the map back up because I think sometimes it helps a little bit to get a little visual. Um, so Bragg will pull himself a little bypass, of course, Nashville. Uh, Buell is pushing forces there. He, Buell has a garrison there anyway, but he's pushing forces back towards Nashville. And Bragg on his own right, he, he's, he's given two divisions to Smith. That's Claiborne's division and Churchill's division. He's given two divisions to Smith. So Bragg is being pretty cooperative um, during this campaign. Um, he's not strong enough to really attack Nashville on his own. There's just no way he's going to be able to do that. He'll bypass Nashville to the east, cross over the Tennessee line, move th uh, through Glasgow, and then that's actually a typo on the part of the trust, by the way. Um, it's not Glasgow. Um, and then uh, come up to a place called Mumfordville. And that's going to be, of course, one of our stops that we do on our, uh, our, our tour in late September, early October this year. Uh, I stopped here at Richmond. I'll, I'll circle back to that here for a second. Um, well, I'll circle back to that now. On August 29th and 30th, really mostly on August the 30th, is probably the most complete Confederate victory of the entire Civil War. Uh, and that happens at the Battle of Richmond because almost that entire force of Union troops uh, commanded later in the day by William Bull Nelson is either killed, wounded, or captured. The vast majority, of course, are captured. Um, and so that will destroy the pretty much the crux of the Union Army of Kentucky. And Kirby Smith will continue to push into Lexington and occupy the capital at Frankfurt. Uh, this is happening early September um, of 1862. The Bragg, by the meantime, by mid-September, he is now in the Mumfordville area. Mumfordville has this huge bridge over the Green River. It's the Green River Bridge uh, for the LNN, the Louisville National Railroad. And his, his advanced forces will run into some uh, a Union garrison that's there on the south side of the river. And um, that Union garrison is initially commanded by a, a colonel whose last name is Dunham, but will be taken over by a colonel whose last name is Wilder. And if you're anybody who's familiar with the Chickamauga campaign, that is the same John T. Wilder. He is, he is defending Mumfordville. Those let initial... Me, hey, oh, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me interrupt and... and... Mm -hmm. And make an observation here, uh, not meaning to take you off the point, but to make an observation that I think off time isn't considered. Part of the reason uh, that Richmond is such a total victory is because the distinction between the different experiences of the, of the competing forces, such all the Richmonders are all rookies. They're all just right. They're all just just barely in the army and don't know left from right hardly. And what's important about that is not to take away from the people who are Richmond who find themselves routed. It's to point out that what the Confederates have effectively done is they have gotten into the deep rear of the federal operations. The front of the federal operations has been pushed forward into Southwest Tennessee Mississippi and Alabama, and the feeder fixes the supplies and the new troops being trained and everything. That's what Smith has found. He is mm -hmm. he has uncovered the the next generation of Union soldiers, and he's got them before they know what to do. And so, the end result is predictable. But but I wanted folks to understand that because it it has a huge impact on the way the Federals respond to Bragg's invasion of of Kentucky and what they, they do and how they try to defend against it. I'm yeah, sorry, absolutely. go ahead. Jack. No, absolutely. And you're hundred percent right. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll make that distinction when we do the tour at Richmond, I will talk about when these regiments on the union side were raised and most of them are raised or mustered into service 11 days before this battle. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, the individual soldier fights actually very well. The, the Confederates will take their, Heaviest casualties at the last portion of the battle in the afternoon. After those rookies have been routed twice or beaten back twice, they'll form one more time and they will actually um, cause the, the highest amount of casualties. So they're still fighting. The individual man is fighting. There's the greenness and there's a lot of poor decisioning um, by the leadership on the Union, union side as well. So, um, and you know, Richmond gets overshadowed. You made the comment about how you, know, you like that battlefield. I do. It's, it's 18 miles long and one mile wide. Uh, if you oh, start yeah, with yeah. down at Big Hill and it's, you know, you can't get to all of it, but you can get, you can see a lot of it. And it's only three, the core port 
is three miles away from a major interstate. So if you've never been there, anybody on this call, uh, please stop by um, to, to tell Phil I said hi if you do. Um, but it's a, it's a, a great, but it's it overshadowed. A, it's over. It's it's a smaller battle. Um, you know, there's five to six to seven thousand guys on each side. It's the same days as the second Bull Run, second Manassas, if you prefer. So it gets massively overshadowed in that uh, aspect as well, uh, which is unfortunate. It is is definitely worth a study. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm I've got a tour there with a with a friend of mine next month. We're going to do uh, kind of a, just a focus on Richmond for a day and a half. So. Um, it's worth the study and it's worth the study in leadership as well as the greenness on, on the union side. Uh, no doubt sure. about it. Um, so you've got, like I said, Kirby Smith now is occupied uh, Lexington, Frankfurt. Uh, so they've taken the, you know, the Confederate, they've, they've taken the Kentucky capital and then Bragg comes up. His advance elements will push into Wilder's forces there at Mumfordville and get punched in the nose. Um, uh, there will be a, a, a siege. I even hate to use that term, but, you know, the, the initial fightings on September 14th and Wilder will not surrender his force until September 17th. And Wilder only has, you know, I, again, about a brigade's worth of troops there. Uh, but what's going on is Bu uh, Buell is finally starting to maneuver to the north and start to catch a little bit to Bragg. And they think there's going to be a major battle in this particular area. And so I think that's why Bragg doesn't push his whole force towards Mumfordville initially, because he's worried now about Buell coming to his rear. And so he's deploying to really face off against Buell. Buell doesn't um, honor his, his, his challenge, I guess. Uh, and so they kind of stare at each other for a bit of time. And then, then Munferville will fall. Bragg will keep pushing forward north. And Bragg is still in front of Buell to get to Louisville. But I think you, you alluded to it, that, that call to 300,000 more, that late middle to late summer of 1862, those fresh troops are pouring into places like Cincinnati and Louisville. So while they don't have the experience, they definitely have the numbers. Uh, and then there are some fortifications that are built around Cincinnati, north of, in the northern Kentucky side. There are some fortifications that start to get built around Louisville. And I think Bragg is probably thinking, I can't crack that nut with the Buell's army behind me. I just don't feel like that's a wise decision. He'll peel off and go to Bardstown, and then he'll try to operate with Smith. And that's a try. That's, I probably need to be underlined and scored heavily. Um, and he, and he will bring into with him um, a, a Confederate governor to be installed, um, which happens on October 4th of uh, 1862. Bragg has also brought with him at least 15,000 muskets to arm those 25,000 to 30,000 Kentuckians that arise up. Um, but on October 4th, you know, by this particular point, I don't know how far you want me to jump ahead, Buell will get to... So, uh, Buell will get to Louisville. Uh, I think the date is September 25th, I do believe, off the top of my head. Uh, a wounded, a slightly wounded Bull Nelson is there. Bull Nelson will be um, shot down. He'll be murdered by Union General Jefferson C. Davis, ironic names. Um, and so Buell is also reforming his army. He is grabbing, you know, between his veterans and then all these thousands of new troops that are coming in, he's reforming his army in the Ohio. And he will launch a campaign on October the 1st. In the interim, he has been relieved of command. He has received the order to be relieved of command. The command is going to be given to George Henry Thomas. Thomas declines the command because Thomas feels like Buell is in the crux. He's in the midst of starting to do something and form this new campaign to march out against Confederates. And so they will depart Louisville on October the 1st. Part of that, his force under Joshua Sill, who will be killed, unfortunately, at Stones River, uh, under Joshua, Joshua Still, will march directly towards Frankfurt um, as as a threat, as a as a as a feint, really. And on October fourth, when this inauguration is going on for the new Confederate governor that Bragg is installing, they can hear cannon fire to the west. It's the Union forces approaching, and Bragg thinks that's the main force. In the meantime, he's got lean on his pulp down in this area here. Uh, Polk's got the, the equivalent of about a core, a large core. And thinking that Sill's force is the larger force, he will order Polk to come up because he wants Polk to hit him in the flank. While Bragg and hopefully Smith's combined forces will smack uh, Sill's force in the front. Again, they think this is the main Union force, but it's not. Buell has marched out of Louisville with three other columns. This is his main force of about 55,000 men. And he will come down to occupy towns along the way, including Bardstown. 
And Polk being the indecisive at times gentleman that he can be, and I'm being kind today, um, will send some information to Bragg, but it's always it's never really clear. The information, that's the, probably the biggest breakdown uh, for at least Bragg's portion of the Army, is the bubbling up of information. You know, it's not getting to higher chain of command. We're not getting accurate information in terms of troop strength that is in front of us. So Polk at one, one point will say, well, there's a small union force, but does it define what that is? Another time he'll say it's a large union force, but does it define what it is? Well, Bragg, again, thinks the main forces up here near approaching Frankfurt. He will tell Polk, deal with what you have in the front, and then I want you coming up and hitting this, this other union force in the flank while we hit it from the front. Uh, of course, none of that happens. Um, Polk will continue to fall back um, and occupy um, the, the heights around Perryville, Kentucky. There's water there. Uh, that's the one thing we also cannot forget. Kentucky is in a severe drought in the summer of 1862. And so we can't forget that water becomes extremely important to both armies. Well, they occupy this, this crossroads little town of Perryville. Uh, it's, it's part of it's for water, but part of it's also for crossroads. They have a crossroads that they can, they can occupy uh, and, and hold and move in different directions as needed. And so, um, well, again, I don't know if I want to jump the gun. I think we're, we're getting to the point where we're really starting to talk about what we're going to cover on the tour. So I don't know if, how far. We'll just leave that as a little bit of a tease. But the result yeah, will be think, the Battle of Perryville. So. Yeah, I, I think what we probably um, I need to do to fairness to the folks, because we're about uh, quarter nine right now. And uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions, um, you can start to formulate those now, and if, if uh, you'd like to raise your hands, you can do so. What I what I'm like us to finish with, um, Daryl, is is I do want to talk about um, the Battle of Paraville, uh, not in ex not in in uh, great detail, but rather to uh, look at it and look at what it means, and and then finish with a um, what are the ramifications for both sides of, of Paraville, the, you Absolutely. Know, the, the month yeah. after Paraville, I'd, sure. I'd like us to finish with that. So, so go ahead with that. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll integrate any questions that may come in at that time. Uh, and, and we'll finish up in about, uh, Oh, 10 to 15 minutes. Sounds great. Um, of course, many of you know, there's a, there's a, there's a battle at Perryville on October the 8th of 1862. And again, this is, Bragg ordering Polk with his, there's three divisions there, ordering that, that force to attack that Union force that's in his front and push it out of the way. And then we're going to come north to join the main army. And of course, it doesn't happen that way. Polk is supposed to launch an attack at around 10 o'clock in the morning of October the 8th and does not launch an attack at all on October the, or, or the morning of October the 8th. Um, Bragg is just 10 miles away at Harrodsburg. He expects to hear the guns firing. He does not. He, he rides down the Harrodsburg Pike to Perryville in haste, and probably with a, a little anger, uh, and meets Polk. They will redeploy troops. They think they're going to hit whatever this Union force is on the flank by redeploying troops more to the north, and they don't. In the interim, you have Buell's three columns are starting to close in on Perryville. As a matter of fact, Buell had issued orders the night of October the 7th for all three core, core to be up and moving and concentrate at Prairieville to launch an attack against whatever Confederates are in their front early morning of October the 8th. The orders do not get to uh, Alexander McCook's wing nor Thomas Crittenden's wing until after well after midnight. And McCook, to his credit, um, his men are tired, they need water. Um, he gets the orders at 2.30 a.m. He has his core, his entire core up and marching by 5.30. And they will approach the battlefield. They will reach the battlefield, what will become the battlefield, 10 or 11 o'clock or so in the morning. And, of course, the water issue will pop up again. In the center column, um, the Corps under um, Charles Champion Gilbert, um, with a division under a guy named Phil Sheridan, with a brigade under him by a guy named Daniel McCook, will push out to what is known as the Peters Hill area because Doctors Creek, there's pools of water there. And so the Battle of Perryville will actually start early, early morning on October 8th, not the two o'clock in the afternoon that most people think it happens. There's brigade activity that's going on on both sides in the morning of, of October the 8th. Sheridan will, will secure his water. Um, he'll be a little aggressive. Gilbert will say, stop being aggressive. We're not bringing on a general engagement because the other two corps are not here yet. 
because of those delay in getting the orders. And Buell is going to attack on the morning of October the 9th. He's letting his two other columns close up. So Sheridan gets a little bit of a smack on the hand and, and becomes a little less aggressive for the rest of the day, unfortunately, for the Federal side. Well, the, the Confederates are seeing whatever this flank is, and it's McCook's Corps, and they, they're going to try to strike the flank. They don't wind up striking the flank. They wind up actually striking uh, him pretty much head on. And so you have this really heavy fighting that goes on really from about 2 o'clock in the afternoon till about 7.30 uh, in the evening until it really gets dark. And again, this is early October, so it gets dark pretty well. Uh, pretty early. There are, depending on what source you read, anywhere from 7,000 to nearly 8,000 casualties in just those five and a half hours. Again, we're at, we can add in McCook's core or McCook's actions and whatnot, but the main part of the casualties are against McCook's core, Alexander McCook's core, uh, from two o'clock till, till 7.30. McCook's 13,000 men are pushed back roughly a mile, and they will secure an area by dark uh, near the what's called the Dixville Crossroads. Well, by this point, Bragg is finally getting intelligence from Joe Wheeler that there are a lot more a lot more Union troops out there. Wheeler has been fighting this delaying action against Crittenden's column all morning and early afternoon, but Bragg will not get this information until about five o'clock in the afternoon. And so the Confederates, even though they have won a tactical victory on the ground, they have pushed back McCook's Corps and inflicted heavy casualties they will wind up re re withdrawing from the ground uh, overnight on October 8th until October 9th. Um, they will retreat back to Harrodsburg. Kirby Smith's forces are not terribly far away. They will wind up eventually kind of joining up. They will go back to, or they will go secure the area around Camp Dick uh, Robinson, uh, which is where the Confederates have been gathering supplies, the supplies they've been able to gather. Um, and they will, they will hold there for a day or two, thinking that Buell will attack them there. Buell does not. Uh, George Thomas has a case of the slows. I'll talk about that during the, the tour itself, both on October 8th and on the days after that. Um, Buell does issue orders to follow up immediately, but they just don't come to fruition. Um, and the Confederates will, will start to pull out of um, Kentucky. Bragg has thrown up his hands. The Battle of Perryville to me, and I love Perryville. I want to make sure we have that straight. That battle is almost an afterthought because realistically, by October the 8th, the, the Kentuckians were not rising up. The Confederate troops could not stay in that state with the amount of forces that were starting to be arrayed against them. Um, and so there's just no way they're going to, they're, they're staying there. They're going to have to leave. The battle is almost unnecessary in a way. Now, of course, it is Kentucky's largest battle. And again, I love that battlefield. I love leaving, leaving tours there. Uh, that's not to take away from the 7,000 to 8,000 casualties either. They, I guarantee they thought it was a, a useful battle um, or important battle. But the Confederates will start to retreat down the Wilderness Road, and they will. a lot of them will go through Cumberland Gap. Buell starts to advance and starts to follow. But that area, again, you cannot sustain an army. You now have the Confederates retreating in front of you. They are stripping everything they possibly can, and Buell doesn't want to follow them. And he will start to move back towards central Tennessee. Um, and he will be relieved of command on October 26th and replaced by William Rosecrans. Um, Bragg's army will fall back. Kirby Smith kind of separates again uh, from Bragg. Bragg will circle back down through Chattanooga, come back up into central Tennessee and occupy Murfreesboro. And then you have a, you know, kind of the dancing that goes on until the Battle of Stones River in late 1862, early 1863. The ramifications, I, I hear this a lot from, from folks when they give an opinion about the campaign. It was Bragg successful. Was it a successful campaign? I will answer that with this. Chattanooga most likely would have fallen in July or August of 1862, most likely. It does not fall until September of 1863. So I would say that the Kentucky campaign, for all of its foibles, at least keeps Chattanooga from falling for a year. Um, Bragg is able to pull supplies out. They do recruit new troops, one-tenth the number that John Morgan had promised. Um, uh, and again, they, they occupy a position now in central Tennessee that they didn't have, they never had that position, right? They, that position was not being occupied prior to that. So there is a delay. Um, and so I think from the Confederate point of view, there, it, you could credit some success to this. Um, of course, it, at the same time, or a little bit earlier, 
You also have the Antietam the Maryland campaign going on. So you've got these two thrusts that are really late summer, early fall of 1862 are really, you know, I, again, I think it's kind of the high point of the Confederacy. They're on the move. They are reversing some of the, the issues they have had. Um, but I think, I think, you know, again, successful to, to, to Bragg stay in Kentucky. I don't think there's any way he could have stayed in Kentucky. And yeah. I think he, he delayed the fall of Chattanooga by over a year. So, well, you know, I think the, the, you, you mentioned, um, that, that Paraville and in so many, I think, uh, throughout history, a lot of some of the most consequential things that happened really first weren't necessary, uh, but happened as a result of circumstances. And the, the, the Kentucky campaign basically ends when Buell gets ahead of a brag and covers Louisville, you know, because because Louisville is is the, the commissary. That's that's the that's the area that's going to sustain them. And and in so many of these, when Price goes into Missouri in 64, um, he wants to go to St. Louis. But, you know, the the way the forces align against him. Uh, he can't get the St. Louis supplies. He can't get to the areas that are that are going to allow them to provision themselves because because the federal larder is very prominent in '62. I mean, even that early, there's never there's never been a shortage of American war stuffs and uh, supply stuffs in any war once the American industrial engine kicked in. Uh, and that, that engine was the manpower advantage, this, this ability to, to have a fully functioning economy that was producing what the armies in the fields needed. Uh, you, 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 you had this, this, this really significant opportunity because, I mean, even if they could just get in and tear up Louisville a bit, because you've got Cincinnati, the largest city in the, in the western part of the United States easy pickings because it's right on the river if you get the opportunity um it, it is a high value uh opportunity but like you said when you get to the point that you can't get to your vittles and the stuff that's going to sustain you it is a long way back when you don't have anything in your haversack and you don't have anything to drink it gets to be a really, really rough go. But, but I also agree with you that in, in the game of chess, what looked like a slam dunk Union victory, Confederates went in, swapped a, a rook and a knight, and got, got a, got a uh, bishop uh, in and around Murfreesboro. And they... Yeah. They get a position that's going to allow them to fight again. So um, uh, it, it is a fascinating campaign. It's not something that, that the Confederacy is going to try to do again. Although one wonders where was Hood really, would Hood really have gone into Kentucky and where the hell would he have gone after he got out of there? Um, I, I'm not, I'm not really certain. And, and there are not, still plenty not of in troops. November, not November, December, because no. he, nope. he can't do the Cumberland Gap. He can't get through the Alleghenies. Uh, in December, so I'm not I'm not sure where the hell Hood was going at that stage. He's of, not going to uh, be able to sustain an army. He can't do no. it. So yeah, no. Yeah, I, th I think Hood's I think Hood's move north in in and looking to Kentucky was was merely draw as many forces out of out of Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee as he could do in hopes of forcing him to come back and cross back in the opposite direction. So anyway. Well, I have been looking, and, and as always happens, people come and they listen and they enjoy, but I don't see any questions. Okay, if anybody's got a question, this is kind of like the, the marriage when the, when the minister stands up and says, if anybody <laughs> objects to this marriage, stand up and speak now or forever hold your peace. So this is your opportunity to raise your hand and get your five minutes of fame. Oh, here we go. Okay. And, and what a surprise to you is Mar Marita has got a question for you. And what, <laughs> what she has said is, she said, Daryl, could you talk a little bit about Humphrey Marshall's role in the 62 campaign? How much of an impact I, did it make on the movements 
of Confederate forces. There's the Seventh Division Army of the Ohio were at Cumberland Gap with 10,000 men until September 17th when they began their march to the Ohio River, of course. <laughs> so, so well, she probably, probably knows probably, more about this than I do. I think she set me up here a little bit. <laughs> hidden question ever presented because her reputation preceded <laughs> this phone call. You knew she was going to be here. Okay, Absolutely. go ahead and answer her. Well, I'm going to try to answer her, but like I said, she's probably going to be able to do this better than I can. She's absolutely right. Of course, uh, George W. Morgan, his Federal 7th Division, is staying in Cumberland Gap, but he is going to start running low on those vittles, right? Um, uh, Kirby Smith's men have cut that wilderness road. His supply route is now cut, um, so he's not going to be able to get more provisions in. They've pretty much stripped the countryside as much as they possibly can, which is the reason why Kirby Smith will continue to pour, push north to the, uh, to the bluegrass and so, um, but George W. Morgan's like, I, I can't keep staying here. And, and, and there's even a little uh, self-published book, I believe, called A Masterful Retreat or something along those lines that's written about just Morgan's retreat from Cumberland Gap to what it was known then as Greenupsburg, Kentucky, Greenup, Kentucky today, uh, over a couple hundred miles of wild and mountainous terrain. So Humphrey Marshall is ordered to come into the state to cooperate with Smith and Bragg as well. Um, he doesn't have a large force. He's got a few thousand men with him. He will come across. He is initially trying to, with a portion of Kirby Smith's force, as well as a chunk of John H. Morgan's cavalry command, to cut off this retreat of George W. Morgan. Uh, John H. will get in front of him a couple times. Um, he's not super successful. Uh, Marshall, I think, is dilatory, to be blatantly honest with you, as well as the, the portion of Kirby Smith's army. Uh, that it will march to try to intercept. Um, and again, Marlita probably knows more about this stuff uh, in this particular case than I do. Um, Marshall, though, will continue into central Kentucky. He is actually at the Battle of Perryville. He is less than 25 miles away from Perryville, and I think that gets overlooked a lot. Um, there is enough of a Confederate force to put together a decent-sized army, and then who knows what happens at that particular point. Um, but when the campaign starts to wind down and Bragg has made his decision, Mark Marshall will make his way back through eastern Kentucky and he will retreat back into um, southwestern Virginia. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sure she can elaborate more than I can on that one. But Smith will, or Smith, George Washington Morgan will get his eight to 10,000 men back to the Ohio River. Uh, a lot of those men will become uh, attached to Grant's army and will serve in the Vicksburg campaign. So a lot of those same regiments will show up in places like Chickasaw Bluffs and, and, and whatnot. So um, Marshall fails, Morgan fails, and that portion of Kirby Smith's army also fails to pin that force down. Uh, it is just an amazing retreat. Um, Morgan has stripped his forces down and they are doing the best they can to live off the land, half and quarter rations almost the entire way. Um, and they will make it back to the, the Ohio River. I can't remember the time, it's less than two weeks, I think. It's something along the, on that range, 12 days. Maybe it's 14 days that they will march a couple hundred miles uh, across that wilderness in eastern Tennessee. So I don't know if that helped or not. 17 days. Thank you. Because <laughs> you, you didn't get it out of your mouth fast enough. Yeah, well, it's okay. I, I am happy to be corrected. I am happy to be corrected. So. <laughs> well, uh, we, we have reached the end of our string. Um, uh, it has been, as always, these are fast paced and um, content filled discussions and uh, for those of you who uh, who want to just immerse yourself in this stuff and an hour is not enough what are we going to give them about 20 20 plus hours uh, face to face doing this and uh, it will be a good time so uh, Daryl like to thank you very much for uh, for taking the time to chat tonight um, Absolutely. Karen thank you for um, for hosting us in your chat room and we'll we'll look forward to the uh the tape of this and you guys who uh are aware of us look for um for this to be up on uh, our youtube channel and tell your friends go take a look at it um uh daryl actually gets paid a commission for every uh person <laughs> who uh who watches this outside the event i did not know that i need to go back and take well, a look at last and, year's and, video <laughs> and i've lied to you grievously i actually keep it all myself but but i'm trying to uh 
to draw the fans that you have, uh, such as they are, to uh, to come and 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 pack the numbers. So, um, folks, I promise the registration form will be up within the week, and um, uh, look forward to it. It's going to be a good time. We're going to base it in um, Danville, Kentucky, and um, some beautiful country. And um, there's always a little branch and um, and uh, bourbon available. Um, yeah, you, you know, I'm going to pick a couple places that I know of that'll have, uh, you know, some good food, local food, um, maybe a beer place or two, something along those lines. That's that's how I like to operate. And I think the, the I think the camaraderie and the discussion is is more wide open when you're uh, sharing a meal. How's that? <laughs> They're always a lot more fun, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we will uh, we'll stick up here for a couple of minutes. You can unmute yourselves uh, as to. Uh, these proceedings, they're officially closed. And, um, and uh, if I can hold on to uh, Daryl for maybe as much as five minutes, we'll allow a little open discussion. But uh, we're finished. Thanks a lot. And have a good night. Thank you, folks. Appreciate everybody came on. Thank you. What's the weather like today in Kentucky? Well, I'm in, I'm in Cincinnati, and it oh, was hot and humid. Yeah, yeah, it's hot and humid. Of course, I can almost see Kentucky, but... Hot and humid, and then we're supposed to have thunderstorms tonight. So it's going to be uh, – we were in the 90s again today. Um, yeah, so, same here. I'm yeah. in College Park, so. Yeah, warm, warm, humid days. We yeah. didn't get much of a spring. It went straight from kind of cold to rainy and then, bam, right into the heat and humidity. So we yeah. didn't get a lot of our 60-degree, 50, 60, 70-degree weather, unfortunately. So. Oh, I think um, those days are gone. Yeah, supposed to be a little hey, better Karen. next week. but. Yeah, honey. Hey, uh, I, I'm looking at the thing. We still got some people hanging on there, and, yeah. and I don't know how do they unmute themselves. I asked them. All I have to, I un I checked it so they can unmute themselves, and I'm also clicking and asking them to unmute. So they okay. Got so any anybody because I see Bradley and Mar Marlita and Andy and whoever Galaxy Fifty One is and Mark Thornton and Gordon <laughs> and so forth. You're still with us. Uh, there we go. If you want I see to say, hey, come on along. Oh, Errol, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, <laughs> answering my question. I didn't really <laughs> answer it. <laughs> it. Well, it was not a setup. But, you know, <laughs> I, I wanted to know, you know, how you actually looked at it. Since you didn't mention him, I, I figured, you know, he needs to be mentioned. I mean, he, he was does. part you, of it. Yeah. Of yeah, course, Marshall does. was not a team player, you know, and that was part no. of the problem. And, but, you know, uh, when uh, George Morgan walked, I mean, marched to the Ohio River, uh, that took away Morgan's forces, basically. Yes. You know, yeah, almost the, almost everything, but almost everything, but all the, the second Kentucky Cavalry, which is uh -huh. Morgan's original regiment, all, all of that, well, except maybe a company or two, all right. that's still under Duke in Northern Kentucky, but the rest of the brigade, yeah, is chasing after George Washington Morgan. They sure yeah, did. Absolutely. And so, yeah. you know, I wondered how that would made an impact. And also, uh, they really didn't know exactly where Morgan would come out of the foxhole. Mm. You know, well, they, they thought maybe Greenup, but then they also thought maybe he was heading to Mount Sterling, which, of course, would have been, you know, the direct path into the bluegrass, which, mm -hmm. you know, 10,000 men, that could have made an impact on, you know, Confederate operations for sure. So I, I think I, if he had marched to Mount, Mount Sterling, though, I think it actually probably would have made it easier for the Confederacy to kind of pin him down. Yeah. Um, because yeah, not, as you as you as you said, they didn't know where he's coming. Right. Where is it? Which way is this guy going? Because then, of the mountainous terrain, he comes up to Mount Sterling where it's now more just rolling. I, I think it actually makes it a little easier for the Confederates. Now, how well they would have dealt with his, his large division, I, who knows? Right. Who I have knows? no idea. I yeah. mean, you know, he had still most of his cannons. Other yep. than you know the really big ones that they have. Yeah, yeah, other than the siege guns, yeah, yeah. the big fortress guns. Yep. Yeah. Hey, so, let me I, ask uh, uh, Andy. You want you unmuted? Uh, you want you want to say something? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have anything to, <laughs> to say. Daryl's probably thrilled that I don't have anything to say. Yeah, I was waiting for. <laughs> I was waiting for some setup from Mister Paper. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, so now I've got. I'll, should I mark Andy's name down as a? Uh, is is uh, somebody to be watched and have oh, a long yes um yes. Okay. you want to stay away from his missouri troubles so that is for certain <laughs> okay so so okay pap and you're marked um <laughs> yeah 
It, it would is, not be the first yeah, time I'm on a list. I mean, we don't forget yeah. people. We don't, yeah. don't forget them. Um, <laughs> how about Dave Bradley, our uh, our erstwhile uh, Englishman who is uh, lost in uh, New Jersey right now? <laughs> well, I just want to say it's been a really interesting um, presentation. I've enjoyed, it. I've very enjoyed it very much. I've, I've actually spent today inspecting the troops. I went up to uh, Washington's head, headquarters in um, Newburg. Yep, yep. I went to the can, cantonment, can, cantonment in um, cantonment area, New Windsor. Yeah. So I've had a very interesting day. Good. Did you get over to uh, the uh, Purple Heart Museum? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. That's, that's, that's the same place as the... As uh, as the cantonment, yes, it's 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 a it's a place that's well well worth visiting. Well, now you know, of course, that you're that that because of where you're at, you're going to have to report to um, to Saratoga, where you will be uh, deported. Um, uh, that's <laughs> one of our two uh, American official ports of deport deportation. Uh, the other one is a place called Yorktown. So. Um, <laughs> After you've worn out your visa, you're going to have to go to Saratoga and be deported. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> well, as, as, it, as it happened, I spoke to people. I spoke to George Washington earlier today, and he said it's fine. I can stay on as long as I like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's who's this egging him on, man? Don't don't egg him on. He's a bloke. He's a Brit. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't encourage him. <laughs> hey, uh, Mr. Mark Thornton, I just see you, you posted you had eight as ancestors in the 69th Indiana. I hope you can make it to one of the Richmond tours. That would be fantastic to talk about those guys um, at their performance there at, 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 at Richmond. So I would love to hear more stories if you have any about your eight ancestors in that one regiment. That's pretty, pretty stellar. So yeah, it looks good. Well, folks, I, I just want to thank you all a whole lot. And, Gerald, I want to thank you for taking the time. And uh, Thanks for having me. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you in, uh, in the fall. And um, uh, you guys check your calendars and hope we'll see some of you there. So, uh, Karen, thank you, ma'am. And um, we'll, see, we'll see you guys next Tuesday for Tom Clemens and Scott Hartwig and uh, Antietam.